Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of Tigra India's talk series. Our guest speaker for today is Dr. Sonia Fizek, who is a digital games and media theorist. She's a professor at the Institute of Game Development and Research alone, and also an associate editor of the Journal of Gaming and Virtual Worlds, which is a leading international journal publishing academic work in the field of game studies. So I would like to welcome Dr. Fizek here. And without any further ado, I will hand over to her. The stage is yours. Um, thank you uh, for the wonderful introduction. And um, yeah, I mean, we're all somewhere else, but I'm super happy that we have uh, gathered uh, uh, here all together to listen to some of my ideas and uh, we'll see how we can, what we do with them later. Um, so thank you for the introduction and thanks for the, uh, for the invitation. Um, so today I will be all, uh, partially uh, reading from my upcoming book. Um, it will come out next year, so still a bit of waiting. Um, and the book will be called Playing at a Distance. Uh, and it's also the first time that I uh, present um, the aesthetic framework of distance, um, or what I call uh, playing at a distance. Uh, underpinned by Karen Barad's philosophy of potential realism. So please bear with me, think along, and I don't have to uh, say it, I think, but question. And I'm very much looking forward to, um, to some dismantling of the ideas at the end of the, of the talk. Okay, there we go. In 19... 35, Albert Einstein coined the, firm, the famous phrase spooky action at a distance in order to dismiss a controversial theory of quantum entanglement, according to which particles separated by great distances could influence one another without the need for direct physical interaction. And those um, weird icons that you see are meant to represent those particles. In other words, despite occupying remote locations, the particles were perceived as intimately linked. At the center of this puzzle lies the materiality behind a medium of communication, or at least this is how I interpret it. For this distant entanglement to be true, the information exchanged between the two particles would need to move faster than light, an occurrence baffling, if not impossible, according to the Newtonian interpretation of the natural world. How can two objects communicate instantaneously over distances so great that the information package stored in light is not able to make it on time before the entanglement had taken place? So I will let this question rest as a playful cliffhanger, but what I want us to take um, from this playful innuendo is the concept of mediated distance or action at a distance. And you will see what I'm leading to. And this concept uh, or the, co the, the distance, the figure of distance is central to how we experience and make sense of games and play in computerized forms. At least this is what I want to argue. Distance is deeply engraved in the media landscape. Without literal distance, there would be no need for a medium aided communication or a communication theory at all. Think of telephone infrastructures, um, digital network, or such mundane devices as remote controls, which have become almost invisible daily companions of many TV equipped households in the last few decades. Not without a reason, one of the most frequently used prefixes to describe diverse media of communication is that of tele, um, which is um, distant um, in Greek, from Greek, telegraph, Telegram, telephone, television are all media of telecommunication. Distance lies at the very heart of games too, especially in their computerized and mechanized realization. But contrary to the intuitive association the term may awaken, my aim is not to study physical distances at play. So I will not show how, for instance, multiplayer online games bring together players from remote part of the globe, although that might uh, seem something really timely <laughs> in the face of the pandemic. Neither do I want to look into physical distances simulated in game worlds. 
What I want to do instead is to present distance as a media aesthetic framework in order to challenge the common understanding of how we interact with technology in general and with video games in particular. So my goal is to analyze different forms of engagement with video games, which require surprisingly little direct or close action from the human players. I want to propose a theoretical position that invites to rethink the human agent as a central player in the gaming performance. In this perspective, human players are not self-governing subjects, but are subjected to the processes and procedures of technical media. In other words, I question modes of analysis based solely on human players' agency and choice. To play is not only to engage, but also to let go, to accept the agentiality of matter and to see oneself not as a player in the game world, but as a player of the game world, uh, to loosely paraphrase Karen Barad, um, who will also uh, be actually the, the central uh, thinker of, uh, of my today's talk. So this proposition may sound a little bit counterintuitive, uh, maybe not to the audience here today, but I guess maybe in a, in a, uh, to a general audience. So let me illustrate it with an example. And I have chosen an example that dates um, decades before the emergence of the first video game. So imagine this, imagine a self-playing piano, its keys moving automatically in a rhythmic dance as if pressed by a ghostly human virtuoso from another space and another time. Until 1920s, when a phonograph and later gramophone completely changed the musical landscape, self-playing pianos, also called um, player pianos or pianolas had been the, on, the only instruments able to mechanically store and replay recorded musical pieces. Musical performances were literally punched onto perforated paper roll. This is uh, what you see here as well uh, in, the, in the image. And uh, this enabled a faithful recreation of a concrete performance played out at the listener's own convenience. Now, coming back to our uh, initial um, uh, quotation from an Albert Einstein, you might say that that was a truly spooky mediated action. Since the era of player pianos, many other media uh, that we know today as well, and older phonograph, gramophone, radio, film, etc., have decoupled space-time dimensions of otherwise synchronous human performances. Digital electronic computers as the newest of all media have also developed a special relation to the question of action at a distance. This time mediated not by perforated paper rolls, but by encoded silicon circuits and digital displays. In many ways, um, and I am, um, I have to shortcut a lot of, uh, of, of uh, thoughts today, but I hope uh, at some point you will read the book and uh, this will become much clearer. But in many ways, when uh, thinking about distance, I was also inspired um, by Brian Sutton Smith call to develop what he called in 2003 in his uh, keynote at the first DIGRA um, to develop a vocabulary of distance within the context of play and games. And this is what, uh, what he was saying back then, you're looking at a screen and you're manipulating a computer which puts you at a great distance. So uh, this was something that um, a remark of his, which was quite, um, let's say, incidental. He didn't really develop that thought further. But when I discovered it, um, coincidentally, I, I found it very, very uh, fitting uh, to this kind of thinking about distance and, and media and how media, how digital media and video games um, operate uh, with that kind of distance in the background. So the framework of distance, you can see it as an aesthetic framework, you can also think about it as a figure, um, has allowed me to open space to think through a variety of peripheral play forms and formats, which are often labeled non-play or not games, despite their highly looted character. So for me, distance at play is above all a medium and meta-centric perspective which sheds light on a diversity of delegated, automated, and otherwise distant experiences of play, 
which tend to be pushed to the edges of gameness. Think of such examples as, and I have here a few screenshots, think of idle games, auto butlers or auto chess, automated mods, walking simulators, playing algorithms, even um, such remote phenomena um, normally to the, to the study of games as cellular automata. So all those things actually um, make us rethink time and again what it means to play. But, and here comes the twist, and we will be soon moving on to Karen Barad, the story of media aesthetic of distant play does not end with the medium. To end with the medium would be to simply flip the coin, to take the agency away from the human and to attribute it to dead matter instead, to claim that things too have agency. Instead of offering a symmetrical story of agency in video games, I want to show how, again, playing on Karen Barad, how meta comes to matter, how it is configured and how it reconfigures. In such a light, the player is part of the gaming situation. They are not in, but of the game world, configured and co-constituted by it. Play is neither a human, in case of digital games, of course. Play is neither a human nor a non-human act. Play emerges out of complex material, human and non-human ludic entanglements. And to put forward such an understanding of play, I will reach out to agential realism, a philosophy of post-human performativity proposed by Karen Barad. So now we will move on to Karen Barad. So distance um, is, let's say, a larger aesthetic framework and uh, in the book, I am dealing with many different theories and Karen Barad's is only one of those. Uh, so it's, um, so the, the distance is the framework and all those theories are like lenses or perspectives that allow me to understand um, many unusual examples um, of games or of practices or playful practices. And a lot of them involving um, self-playing um, algorithms. So something which at least at the beginning of my research seemed really perplexing to me. Okay. Interaction at play. And this is also um, a, a term uh, from Karen Barat. And as you will see in that talk, actually a term she takes from Niels Bohr, uh, from a physicist. Um, and a, a term that I think is really um, revealing in terms of how we can understand what's going on in games and especially uh, in case of games where human agency is really not that much at stake. So let's delve into our background example. I think most of you might recognize that game already. The screen flickers with a myriad of warm fluorescent colors, yellow, orange, and red. My palms cling to the soft plastic curves of the gamepad and thumbs sway in a semi-automatic dance. The sound of branches cracking in the heat accompany me on my way through the virtual woods. The Shoshone National Forest is being consumed by wildfire while I am trying to maneuver Henry safely to the helicopter. With persistence, I keep turning the tiny joysticks and pirouettes, but the figure on the screen would not move an inch. My fingers keep pressing all of the buttons in an ever-growing exasperation to no avail. The game does not seem to care. The game's world floats in a trance-like state of ambience, as if waiting impatiently for me to act upon it. But I can't. Soon I discover the rather mundane reason for this frustrating moment in the final minutes of Firewatch. My game controller run out of battery life. For a moment, the taken-for-granted relationship between me and the game has repolarized itself. With the repolarization, the old unresolved question hit back. Where does the subject, in this case the player, end and the object, the game, begin? Opening with, the, with this um, gameplay scenario, I would like to entertain a somewhat controversial proposition. And it only sounds controversial before we delve into, uh, into Karen Barad. And the proposition is this that players and games as such do not exist, at least 
not in the sense we have got used to think about the two. Neither players nor games can be seen as clear-cut predefined entities, preceding and pre-existing the moment of play. Only through and within play, both unfold in a mutual ludic embrace. And although at first glimpse, the boundaries may strike as obvious, they all seem to intuitively think we know who the player is and what the game is or where they end, those boundaries actually never sit still. Players and games are not individual entities separated by predefined sharp edges. Theirs is not a static relationality, but a doing, the enactment of boundaries, to expand on Karen Barad. As I will argue, to challenge the prevalent patterns of thinking about video gaming and what follows digital play, we need to take a performative turn. And I'm, of course, not the first one who takes the performative turn. One of your uh, guest speakers uh, from a few weeks ago, Darshana Jaimain, uh, has written a lot on performativity. And um, Karen Barat's philosophy, though, um, when thinking about this performative turn, the philosophy of agential realism, I think, provides a perfect framework um, for that kind of an analysis. With Karen Barat's performative perspective comes along a major ontological shift. And this is really crucial, kind of keep at the back of our heads. This shift that uh, stands in opposition to Cartesian dualism, founded upon the distinction between the internal mind and the external matter. And just to uh, very briefly uh, illustrate this with examples from media studies and games, this division has become so entrenched within Western imagination that it is seen today as a pure common sense. And this is also what Barad uh, writes extensively upon. The predominant popular and scholarly understanding of video games has been also not exclusively, but very much influenced by this kind of Cartesian thinking. Consider those uh, foundational splits, for instance, between hardware and software or the visual and the computational, computational or um, the rule-based and the narrative. This, the third one especially uh, sounds quite familiar, right? So this, this whole debate that has uh, never taken place, um, the, the, the narrative, the ludology narratology debate, and that sense, if you, if you think about it, is also a very Cartesian one. And maybe by the end of this talk, we will understand that the debate itself doesn't really make much sense from an ontological perspective. Um, so the computer game's core, and this is the, again, the kind of Cartesian story, is usually understood as that which is algorithmic, procedural, mechanical, or at least rule-based, while the visual or the narrative-related components are seen as ornamental alter layers, according to this Cartesian perspective. Um, so this juxtaposi juxtaposition appears in early, especially in early foundational texts uh, devoted to games. Also, the concept of interactivity is strongly embedded in Cartesianism. It presupposes two separate entities, players and games, in our case, interacting with each other. However, um, as we will see, hopefully, it is not necessarily the case. Leaning on Barat's ontological framework, I want to move away from interaction towards intra-action. That is from a symmetrical action flow exerted by the human player on the game or the gaming apparatus to a fluid entanglement of forces. So interaction is a fluid entanglement of forces. Um, so let me exp express it more bluntly. Video games have never been interactive. This is qu quite of an argument to make or to dismantle. Interactivity as a concept has been simply taking at face value a foundational problem I address uh, in my book. But to be able to see an alternative, as Barad uh, puts it, and I quote, it takes a healthy skepticism towards Cartesian doubt. So let's get a little bit skeptical. Um, before we kind of understand um, Barad a little bit better, it might be that many of you have, have read her, which will make our um, debate maybe at the end much um, 
easier. But in case you haven't, I have to kind of uh, start a little bit from, from the beginning. So agential realism, this uh, proposition of hers, emerges at the crossroads between physical philosophy of a physicist Niels Bohr, and we will move on to him uh, in a sec, and the famous, feminist performative philosophies of Donna Harwin and Judith Butler. You could also place agential realism in the long line of other theoretical approaches and uh, discursive fields contributing to the so-called material turn, um, such as ac uh, ac uh, actor network theory, a dispositive, or interdisciplinary perspectives developed under a broad banner of the ecology of mind or new materialism and posthumanism. So all of those are kind of have a lot to do uh, with one another. And although they are all um, grounded in different disciplines and supported by diverse mythologies, uh, methodology, sorry, and often develop with divergent uh, cultural context, all the above thought movements have one uh, or seem to have one thing in common. And this is the uh, thing that is really important for, for my argument here. They challenge the Western anthropocentric position of the human in the world. So the human is no longer a central agent, but part of a complex network of agencies, human and non-human alike. And matter is no longer seen as of course, in, in, in quotation marks, dead, it is not simply acted upon. So games are not simply played, acted upon. Matter becomes an integral part of any act. Matter is a meeting point, and that's barad of material and discursive acts. And uh, to navigate through this complex material field, Let's start uh, with our Cartesian cut and um, the inherent distinction between the subject and the object. So this cut is produced uh, or produces a figure which is well known to positivist science, that of an objective human observer setting up a material apparatus, which is regarded as external to the very object that is being observed. In other words, the object is viewed as something existing independently of the action of its observation. You can also think, you know, substitute now the word object with the word game. The game is viewed as something existing independently of the act action of its observation or of its play. It does not influence the observer and unless desired is not influenced by the act of observation. So those two exist separately. This common sense belief in scientific processes of observation and measurement has been challenged in 1920s by Niels Bohr. And Niels Bohr and, um, is, is crucial to um, Karen Barat's philosophy of agential realism, which, uh, uh, which has uh, taken up, I think, in 1990s and, of course, uh, in 2000s. Um, so Niels Bohr, and we will just very shortly move to quantum theory, um, he says that it's impossible to decouple the act of observation from that which is being observed. And today it maybe sounds a little bit less controversial, but back in 1920s was a very controversial and almost unscientific uh, thing to say. So uh, let me illustrate what he meant uh, with the famous double slit experiment. And I am not really, a, um, I'm not a physicist, I'm a humanist, but it's quite crucial to just maybe devote a few minutes to it in order to actually understand uh, Karen Barad's thinking and how, um, how it uh, kind of um, dissolves the, the Cartesian thinking and how it makes it really um, enlightening um, to think about uh, many phenomena, games including. So just for, 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 for a little sec, uh, Niels Bohr and uh, physics. So according to classical physics, and this is what Barad explains in her text as well, uh, the world is composed of two types of entities, particles and waves. Whereas particles are localized entities and they occupy a certain place in space and time, so they cannot be in two places at the same time, waves behave very differently. And we kind of all know it intuitively, they overlap with one another, and uh, this phenomenon known to anybody who has ever observed um, water waves. 
So from an ontological perspective, particle and waves couldn't be more contradictory. And the double slit experiment, and this is kind of the, the whole um, the core of this uh, ontological thinking, is a setup whose task is to discern whether an electron, which enters at the beginning, whether the electron sent through two slits turns out as a particle or a wave. And it cannot be uh, one and the other at the same time, right? It has to be either or. So um, if the electron turns out to be something composed of particles on the other side of the double slit, it will form a different kind of pattern, a scatter part, pattern. If it turns out to be a wave, it will uh, form a different kind of pattern. She calls it, uh, Bohr calls it, and, and Borat mentions it, diffraction pattern. But the whole experiment, uh, without going into details, resulted in demonstrating that electrons, which are sent through the double slit par uh, as particles, end up building up patterns, characteristics of waves. And um, the big lesson from is this. So Niels Bohr interprets this contradictory state by arguing for the inseparability of the apparatus of measurement and the observed object in the so-called theory of complementarity. Um, so it acknowledges that items may manifest themselves as having mutually exclusive properties. And Barad uh, uh, reinterprets it and says actually that nature has always been queer. Light, um, as this experiment shows, is both a wave and a stream of particles. It all depends on the experimental framework. So it all depends on how we test it, how we look at it, and on the conditions under which it is being observed. So this perplex perplexing duality of neither nor provided an ontological insight into the ambiguity of nature itself. And now you kind of probably see where I'm going, right? Ambiguity is, is this kind of core. So the key ontological lesson from this is um, that independent objects with measurable attributes do not exist prior to and outside of measurement. There are no things, quote, before the measurement. There is no game before play. And the very act of measurement produces determinate boundaries and properties of things. So objects cannot be taken for granted as objective reference. What we are able to observe or catch in the moment are phenomena. In the case of the experiment described um, here, the interaction of what physics calls the electron with the concrete apparatus. So according to such a perspective, the ontological change of the electron alongside the change of the apparatus should not come as surprise. What is being measured is not an independent electron, but a phenomenon in the making. And I think this is uh, uh, quite crucial. So it's an ontological shift. Uh, things are not as clear cut as it seems and objects do not pre-exist the moment of measurement or observation. So that's enough about quantum, phys quantum physics. But if this sticks to you, you will kind of understand uh, um, Karen Barad, I think, much more easily. And it will not only be a conflation of, of terms like entanglement or diffraction, and which have uh, a little meaning. So the world of quantum physics experiments and indeterminate ontologies of electrons seems very remote from what we observe in our daily lives and or gaming sessions. The question is then how to adapt the particle wave dualism to human experience. And this is where Karen Borat comes in and begins her journey with the philosophy of a gentle realism with ambiguity and the paradox of mutual exclusivity on the human level. Following into the footsteps of quantum physics, Barat sees matter as a dynamic, always reconfiguring articulation of the world. Now, I think after uh, uh, Niels Bohr's and double slit experiment, you can kind of understand what she means when she says that matter is of the world as opposed to in the world. It's not pure rhetorics. Matter cannot be in the world because it doesn't pre-exist <laughs> the world. It's part of it. It's co constituted by it. It is an active participant in the world's becoming 
in its ongoing intra activity. So intra activities is uh, based on this um, queer, let's say, ontology, whereas interactivity is based on Cartesian dualism. And um, that's, let's say, the, the, the thought kind of movement here. So Barat's philosophy questions the main assumption of uh, the so-called representationalism, according to which the world is composed of individuals as an indivisible units of beings that exist as individuals with a set of attributes which, which pre-exist their cultural representation. Let us have a look at a, a specific field, um, which or maybe let's uh, just to kind of summarize a little bit. So agential realism is a philosophy based on relational ontology, one that shies away from the geometries and binary oppositions, according to which a human is either a pure effect or a pure cause. It rejects the atomistic worldview in which individual entities with properties pre-exist actions, and it questions the existence of what she uh, calls relata before relations. Things are no longer basic ontological entities. So that's not a story of fixed Cartesian cuts between already existing entities and agents, but an intervention into the very premise upon which agency rests. The distinction between the subject and the object or the agent and the acted upon is not fixed. It may change depending on where we place the so-called agential cut. So it's really context and situation dependent. So coming back to games, and now also moving <laughs> into a concrete example, think about our initial anecdotal example of, of um, Firewatch, of me not being able to perform an action because I ran out of battery. In an agential realist uh, uh, reading, we do not start the game with separate interacting ent entities, a human player exercising their agency over a game via a controller. But instead, we look at how subjects and objects emerge through concrete interactions, how they come to being in local situational context, which may vary depending on the setup of the experimental or ludic apparatus. So in the case of Firewatch, and I think uh, this is a, this was of course a coincidence, and I really it really happened one evening. I ran out of battery, and this uh, was you know it's beautiful serendipitous moment in research where something happens and it kind of makes you realize um, uh, that you uh, makes you understand theories you're wo working with much better. So literally, and and that gaming session for me, the power cut has literally marked the agential cut. So in the moment of the power cut, I have been deprived of my perceived agential power over the object of play. No longer was I the acting subject within the play game constellation. Now, um, thinking about video games, that's um, video gaming is a particularly fascinating exemplary setup for uh, Barat's theory. As games share a lot of similarities with measurement um, apparatus. While playing, we are leaving it. That's because the games are uh, as simple as not, we're talking about video games. That's due to the, the fact that they're digital. So when we're playing, we're leaving behind huge amounts of raw data. And since play takes place within a staged encoded environment, each of our moves can be potentially recorded and extracted for later analysis. So in this context, a game becomes part of a larger apparatus calibrated to pin down play with numbers, graphs, and uh, patterns. So let us have a look at a specific field which illustrates the crossover between agential realism and gaming. And I, for this, uh, quite consciously, I have not taken a game or a play session I have taken a, a kind of a branch called game analytics uh, because I think it really uh, is a perfect example uh, uh, to show, uh, to think alongside agential realism. So game analytics relies heavily on the so-called telemetry. It's also funny when we think about um, uh, my uh, initial framework of distance, right, telemetry. 
Game metrics, so it's game analytics relies heavily on telemetry, game metrics, and data visualization to assist developers in understanding player movement or behavior patterns. Telemetry enables a remote collection of data without the need to place players in a physical space in front of the game. Game analytics then may be understood as a technology and a method that measures play over distance. The source of telemetry most strongly represented in current game development is something uh, called user telemetry. So the data on the behavior of players, for example, on their interaction with games, purchasing behavior. This is especially true for um, uh, mobile games and, and different monetization uh, strategies there. But you can also measure uh, physical movement. Uh, you can measure interaction with other users and other applications. And this type of data is then, of course, stored in various database formats, and then it is made, um, it's transformed into interpretable data, the so-called game metrics. And examples of interpretable data may include something like average completion time uh, of an individual game level, average weekly bug fix rate, revenue per day, number of daily active users, if you are on the game design uh, or game development side of things. This is what you usually want to find out about your game with, with this kind of uh, game analytics. You can also identify the points in time and space and levels where players uh, tend to disengage in order to improve your game design. And uh, this type of measurable data is usually interpreted and represented in the forms of diverse visualizations, of course. Because otherwise it will be very hard to interpret those. And uh, I'm not a game an uh, analyst and we will not uh, perform a, a close uh, analysis of that sort, but it's just uh, as an example for us to kind of engage with. So this one here is, is just an exemplary um, dashboard of one of such tools for, for, for game analytics, Delta DNA. Um, they have been acquired by Unity, and so now uh, I think it's coming literally next month. Unity, the the game develop the game one of the game engines, the leading game engines, will have the possibility of an integrated game analytics tool. So it is actually quite central. It has become central. This kind of measurement, this kind of apparatus, has become central to the process of of game development, game design. Um, so let's have a, a look at this right now. Just let's, let's think about it uh, for a second. That's our case scenario. And let's see what it means to place an agential cut within a concrete game analytics apparatus. So that uh, image that we see here illustrates a demonstrational versions of the dashboard. And that gives us an overview of different performance indicators inside of the game analytics tool. The players in play patterns are segmented according to set characteristics. And what you can see here is something like new incoming players, active players, and players measured by retention values, daily, weekly, and so on. It is also possible to view the numbers of players who are performing monetary transactions. We can compare the action of selecting a particular slice of data to performing an agential cut. The cut changes the lens, and that, that's, I think, uh, the agential cut is, of course, the, uh, the term from Karen Barad. So the cut uh, changes the lens through which we study the selected now, slice of data representing a slice of gameplay. So look, looking at in-game performance means focusing on user counts, daily, weekly, monthly, session counts, number of return visits to the game, number of dropouts from the game, we can also focus on level specific questions such as how many users progress through each level, how many quests are completed, how many users complete each level and so on and so forth. But, and here's the twist or here's the strong link with agenda realism that a data driven gameplay analysis and doesn't matter what kind of uh, uh, things that we're actually measuring there. This kind of analysis, it does not reveal play patterns in real time or not only, this is of course what the tools are there for and the, what, what they kind of promise. But more importantly, it determines certain behaviors and precludes others. 
So game analytics could be regarded as a metronome, marking desired rhythms of play rather than exclusively objective scientific apparatus, which unobtrusively glances over the player's shoulder. According to such an interpretation, gameplay data is not only a byproduct of human action, but an agent of play, which contributes to the reinforcement of those game design patterns, which are able to regulate the player's behavior in a desired format. And this is where game analytics meets agential realism. Think of the apparatus we discussed in the previous section, or in the uh, previously with um, uh, Niels Bohr, um, in relation to quantum physics. An experimental setup was supposed to measure the behavior of a particle and determine its unquestionable nature. Instead, it ended up co-producing the very phenomenon it was supposed to capture. As Niels Bohr argued, it is not possible to perform an a priori interpretation of the nature of a particle. In other words, Experimental setups are in complex ways entangled with their objects of measurement. And it is, of course, exactly the case uh, here with game analytics. They're not uh, as much measuring an objective performance of a player or a gamer. They are co-constituting uh, this kind of performance. And by um, changing the game and responding to the player's wishes or play patterns or behaviors, we are, of course, um, co-constituting those kinds of behaviors per se. So um, a Barradian reading of video games may be revealing in many contexts. And um, for this talk, I have actually uh, tried to kind of illustrate it uh, on the one hand with, uh, with this anecdotal example of uh, an empty um, game uh, empty battery life of a game controller, and on the other hand, by zooming a little bit into, um, into game analytics. Uh, and that's because of this in affinity between game analytics um, as an apparatus, a ludic apparatus of measurement, and our initial example illustrating Barat's philosophy and coming from physics, which is also focusing on an apparatus of measurement. So I wanted to stay kind of uh, close on that level of analysis. Um, but of course, um, and I guess this is where I'll be really interested uh, to hear your ideas. Of course, we can apply uh, this re relational ontology and Barat's thinking um, to other examples from games or gameplay sessions or behaviors or specific game formats, um, not only uh, thinking about um, game analytics. Agential realism brings in a necessary perspective to the study of games and play. It allows us to understand why, despite a huge effort behind what is often called the science of gameplay, the actual experiences of thousands of players are nevertheless personal and often surprising. Despite clear player typologies or study models, the experience of play tends to escape fixed meaning time and again. It's just it remains ambiguous, right? To come back to Brian Sutton Smith here. And that paradox is only troubling within the context of Cartesian dualism. The uncertainty and unpredictability at and off play is its inherent characteristic, not a metaphorical glitch. So something, and this is uh, one of my favorite quotes, just to close this uh, from Brian Sutton Smith, when he says, something about the nature of play itself frustrates fixed meaning. Play then is a bit like a queer electron, which keeps escaping its uh, fixed position. And theoretical explanations can barely pin it down, to put it colloquially. Games take on different ontological shapes depending on how we measure them and what we're looking for. Um, thank you. Uh, this has been a bit long, so I hope you're still awake and uh, <laughs> ready for discussion. up <laughs> you know we're all up yeah. uh, so uh, thank you for quite that interesting talk and uh, I would like 
to uh, invite Dr. Shubhit to say a few words before uh, we move towards the question and answer section, if he has anything to add to this. Oh, uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, thank all the uh, people who are, uh, who've made it today to the uh, kind of talk today. Of course, of course, uh, Sonia Fizek, uh, Dr. Sonia Fizek, my dear old friend, uh, but who's uh, given such a fantastic talk. We'll come to the question and answers later. But I just wanted to very quickly thank DIGRA, the Digital Games Research Association, for uh, giving us uh, well, access to a Zoom Pro account so that we are now not kind of wandering from one meeting to another, but uh, we are able to kind of um, conduct meetings uh, and lectures and talks in a more orderly way. So thank you again to Digra if you're listening well. Uh, yeah. And of course, thanks hugely to Sonia. And I know that many people are actually kind of uh, waiting to ask questions, including me, but I shall open the floor. Uh, well, I shall, I shall return, return this to Jeffrey. So Jeffrey, over, over to you again. Uh, thank you for your words. Uh, I would not like to open uh, the floor for uh, the questioners. Uh, please be free to uh, feel free to ask these questions, or you can type it in the chat, and I will be asking the questions to Dr. Pizek. <laughs> and now I also see some of the comments on, on the chat. It doesn't have to be a question, it can be a comment or, or something that troubles you. And I can't promise I have answers. I'm kind of also looking for them <laughs> in a way. I think Nishargo Bhattacharji has a question. Slash. Yeah, you can uh, go ahead, Nishargo. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, thank you for that talk. I've been really looking forward to this one in particular. <laughs> so uh, I have uh, like one question because I was thinking about the pleasure of gaming. Uh, now, if I think about the game from this interactive point of view, uh, well, most, uh, what would happen if I start playing after taking this into mind? Like, uh, I can think uh, whether it would increase the pleasure increase of gaming or not. Is the audio all right? Uh, just to, yourself, just to make sure I have understood. Um, so whether the perspective of agential realism, when we take this and combine with games, whether it um, in some way allows us to understand the pleasure of gaming. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether it would increase or decrease my pleasure while I'm gaming. Like uh, from one point of view, I would say it might increase this because it would make the game even more interactive. Like I, it would make it more immersive as an experience. Uh, but right, on okay, the now I see other hand, on the other hand, uh, uh, I was thinking uh, that, well, for many gamers, it's about being in a position of power. So I, I am the subject. Mm acting and I have the position of power playing the game. But if uh, my agency, agency goes away, that pleasure goes away. So I was thinking whether it would, what would really be the effective thing here? Okay, let me uh, try to answer this. Um, okay, I think there are, uh, uh, there are two different things that you're touching upon. So when you said, um, uh, being in the position of power. This is true for, for many games or, or for, uh, for most games. And, um, and I think uh, when we think about the, this kind of position of power, which of the power that we have over the, over the game or over the system, um, this is where we can kind of see why certain debates in the past few years have been problematic and how uh, uh, the whole debate of not games or not real games, or this is not a real game have emerged. Uh, because every time we have been confronted with uh, games which like walking simulators or games which actually either deprived us of this kind of power over the system or where this power over the system was uh, quite little, 
So uh, in walking simulators and Dear Esther is probably quoted as one of the first ones. We don't, we cannot really do a lot. I mean, from a narrative perspective, yes, but um, uh, there's not a high skill that is involved uh, in those games. And for many people uh, now, not thinking about theoreticians, but for many gamers, this was a problem intuitively because that kind of position of power has been either endangered or not really there. Um, so I think, on, so one uh, way to answer this, and now I will move on to pleasure in a sec, is I think thinking with agential realism or thinking with interaction is actually, I think it's more of a theoretical move really. It's for us when we ask ourselves, why, why is something considered a game? And sometimes it's, uh, um, for many is not a game. And there's not an easy solution to this one and not a single definition of game can actually deal with that. It's, it's because of interaction and interaction actually. So it's not about um, exposing this kind of, or, or exercising the power over the game or over, the, over an object. It's on a theoretical level, it's actually realizing that it's uh, those boundaries between us as players and the games are much more fluid. And in many uh, examples, uh, it's not that clear where this power is exercised. And if there's not enough power exercise, it stops being a game. Only if we really think about that, that's a necessity. Now, about the pleasure and immersion. Um, I, I don't think this theory can actually answer to that question of pleasure. Uh, I kind of see where you're coming from because most of uh, most of the time we think about interactive systems, we think about this uh, interactivity as the um, as a necessary condition for uh, this kind of medium to be pleasant. We want to act in it, but uh, agential realism doesn't really say that you're not acting. And in this talk, for the first time, I was actually not showing even games that are self-playing. And I have a lot of those in, 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 the, uh, in the book because it's not about uh, giving up the act of play. It's, uh, it's about um, rethinking what it actually means. It's about uh, realizing that the game, the system is also having a lot of agency in that case. So it's not only that we are playing games, they also play us. It's quite metaphorical, but in a sense, um, this kind of situation emerges, uh, this, it can be pleasant, sure, uh, but in many way, ways, uh, how we can perform in the system and how we find it pleasant depends a lot, not only on us and our power, it also depends on that infrastructure of that particular system, that particular game and what it allows me to actually do with it. So I don't think that theory can answer the question of pleasure, whether it increases or decreases. It's just a lens of, of looking at uh, players and games and understanding their um, relationship uh, on a more ontological level. It uh, doesn't uh, really solve the design questions, which are not ontological. Sure, it can be pleasant or, 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 uh, or not. It's, yeah, I think it, it doesn't really answer the question of pleasure at all. Yeah, thank you for the answer. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Anubhav. Uh, would you like to ask it or should I read it out? Uh, well, I guess then uh, I'll be getting his question. Uh, he says that it's an interesting perspective, uh, uses in gratification and pleasure. Uh, by speed. Uh, what about existential aspects like battery being depleted? or overall interactivity of new media. Okay. Can you develop that question? Because it's quite broad. So I'm not sure, I, I, I'm not sure where exactly you're going. Uh, uh, how that theory taps into interactivity of digital media in general. Uh, so while uh, he does think about the question. Uh, Dr. Shovik also has a question. It's how does uh, agential reality take into account the subaltern? Uh, I thought of the metaphor of the spent battery in the controller. The player wants to move but cannot, just as the colonized subject who wants to be heard but cannot. 
if play is a queer electron that cannot be shut in a watertight category, can the subaltern, that is in the colonial scenario or even worse, under slavery, play? Okay, that, <laughs> that's a heavy one, Shubhik. I, I see it also written, I will read it again to myself because that's quite uh, complex. Okay, I thought of the metaphor of the spent battery in the controller. The player wants to move but cannot, just as the color subject wants to be heard but cannot. The player is a queer electron that cannot be shot in a wonderful category. Color center of the worst. Mm -hmm. um, I think though, when, when we talk about, uh, okay, when we put ethics into it, right, and politics into it, it uh, we're also moving uh, uh, to another. Uh, to another level, I think. So we are uh, I'm not sure if it's an ontological, uh, if it's an ontological question then, because, I, and that's what's so hard about Karim Barad, and I'm still kind of grappling with it. I, I took the battery, the empty battery, as an example because it's, um, I think, um, it just exposes um, uh, this object-subject relationship and how, in a given situation, theoretically, I was in the position of power that power all of a sudden was gone <laughs> just because of an empty battery. So the, the matter manifested itself. Um, and it wasn't meant to be like this. It's just that I lost the battery, but it was quite of an ironic uh, or an iconic in a way moment. Now, um, I think it's also kind of difficult enough when Barat takes it from the level of, you know, it's a different th uh, uh, story to talk about um, electrons and particles and waves and it's a very different uh, level if you take it to the to the human to the human level it's it's quite uh, may seem a little bit confusing uh, uh, in the first glance but what you're kind of uh, playing with is this is taking it not only uh, it's taking it to, to to the ethical and political level and um, and I'm not sure if agential realism um, actually gives a I'm not sure if it gives a, a solution to this, to be honest, uh, or how it can give a solution to, uh, you know, to empower the the subject, which is here actually deprived of power in that sense. Um, I've, I mean, if it did, uh, we would have activism based on agential realism and things would work out, but it's not, uh, I think the only, the, I mean, I think the, the only link I can see is to Barad with this is maybe uh, to kind of quote again Barad's uh, when she says it's so important to look at situation and context. And I think this is the, on, the for me, it's the only link. It's just, um, you always have to, th uh, you always have to look at things in a given context. And this is where I could see it kind of tapping into the ethical and the political questions. You can't just say, uh, take the uh, Northern American post-colonialism as in lens and transport it to Europe or India. It's a different, uh, it's a different uh, historical cultural moment. It's a, it's, a, it's a different society. You always have to look contextually and situationally. And that's the link I kind of see. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Queer electron metaphor is such a beautiful one. It is, yes. <laughs> it's not mine. It's it's hers, of course. This kind of queerness of yeah of nature. That's what she's arguing. Really nicely so, yeah, and and such a fantastic talk. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just kind of like provoking other kind of you know uh, avenues to kind of you know push it into uh, you know sure well, you know, aspects of play. Is play possible under certain circumstances? Agency. I mean, whether it it gives agency, you know, to in such circumstances, and what would it mean? Um, um, I guess. I mean, you could think of situationalists and uh, in in many ways of of using. Uh, I don't know, playful, if you can call it play, but some kind of uh, play in a sense that there's something. Uh, uh, there's a little bit of movement, right? There's a possibility of movement. Play gives this possibility of moving out of, uh, of rigid structures, like really thinking now a bit more metaphorically. And in that sense, it should give a little bit of, uh, of freedom. 
but uh, what would that mean in a very concrete situation? I think is a very different. It's a very different question, and I wouldn't uh, give here positivist answers as in you know games can change the world because um, or you know gamify uh, civic action. I really don't think it's that simple. <laughs> Um, okay, so Prabash also has a question for you. Uh, you can unmute yourself, Prabash. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. I mean, don't have a question, but was really uh, really concerned with the with the fact of treating uh, like the definition of things, like uh, subject object uh, relationship, and that has to be collapsed. Each acts on each other in order to form relationships. Uh, that's all. That's all uh, understood. But like I was thinking about the post phenomenology of Verbeck and Dornhide and thinking about the intentionality of things. Things are also subjected to human intentionality, supposedly a speed breaker, right? So it is not that we just encounter the thing, but also that intentionality, which might be political and which might be governed by certain power. So what I was thinking is when we uh, when we are doing a theory like this, uh, what what would stop it from being uh, being like um, an anti politics machine in that sense? You no, know, on one thing, mm -hmm. one hand, and second one, the question that I had was when we look at distance between um, between two things um, in spatial terms, then probably. Uh, probably things do not exist before measurement. But when we look at things separated in time, like in historical time, so in that sense, games do exist prior to play. Historically, games exist before we even play them. So mm -hmm. game play is another thing, but games do exist as objects. So I was thinking about those two things. I mean, if you could respond to that. Thank you so much. Enjoyed your talk really a lot. It helped me think. Wonderful questions. And I mean, yeah, so complex, especially the, the, the historical context. I think, uh, so like diachrony and synchrony in a sense. Um, um, sure, I mean, um, I think if, if you think about the historicity, it is um, a certain idea or a concept of a game or, or a genre or whatever we think of that surely exists, but it's uh, it's, not the same to say that the that this particular game in its um, kind of ludic instantiation exists, right? So what we're talking about, right? When we talk about uh, examples of games, let's say from the past, like let's say we look at Never Tafel, um, uh, which was a very popular game before chess, we have a an interpretation uh, of um, how that game was played. We, uh, there are of course some objects like archeological thinking that have been found. We are placing it in a certain kind of culture context to try to think uh, how it might've been played. Um, but uh, it's a different uh, category, I guess, to think about it in, in this kind of historical way and to think about really that particular game as played in a particular moment in a particular situation. So, uh, but you're quite right. His, historical dimension um, makes this, of course, much more complicated because it's, it's something slightly else than looking at, at a, in an experimental setup. So let's say looking at two people playing Schnefatav, playing chess or playing local multiplayer in the moment. And um, I guess what this theory does and what, why it's so interesting or uh, to me at least is that it kinds of, it makes us see that the, the, the object itself is much more complex. So in that sense, it doesn't pre-exist the moment of play or, or the subject is that uh, while we interact or interact with it or even with one another, it's not the same every time we do it. It's slightly different. It uh, might be that the rules are, the, the more rigid the rules are, the more, of course, repetitive this and we will always be able to play chess according to the rules, but the game of chess, our game, will not be the same um, each time we play. So I think uh, I think it's really uh, this this 
theory or this kind of ontology has to has to be kind of understood more uh, as, as something which is um, revealing the experience of something that is in the moment of. Um, but that's not to say that uh, a certain um, object doesn't uh, doesn't have a doesn't have a history. But I have to really I have to kind of uh, uh, give an extended uh, uh, thinking to 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 your point because it's um, it's really interesting and it um, um, it complicates. Uh, I think the, the, the application of agential realism to games a lot, uh, which is great. And uh, then you also mentioned the anti, uh, the anti politics machine. I think um, just super quickly, I think uh, what is what we really have to be kind of careful about is um, this concept of uh, responsibility, right? And uh, that's what I'm, I think I, I didn't politicize or I didn't touch upon ethical issues in my talk, but at the beginning I mentioned I don't just want to flip the coin and I guess an agential realism doesn't do it. So I don't want to say that now I take the agency away from the human and we just have a, a flipped uh, argument saying it's the matter that acts. Right. Uh, this is actually uh, quite ethically um, questionable because that would mean that humans are not taking any responsibility, and uh, uh, I, I I don't uh, think that's that should be the case. But a gentle rule doesn't really do it. It just says that that the categories that we usually think of in a Cartesian way as something that is just pre-context, they are much more um, um, refined and and you really have to look at a certain context center situation certain measurements in our case certain gameplay uh, in order to really kind of see what's going on and you can't just pre assume otherwise you would have a perfect definition of a game and a perfect understanding of how to make a pleasant game and we don't know <laughs> and that's because it's so specific context specific actually but I, yeah, I love your uh, the way you're kind of combining those two things: historicity and then the uh, the anti-politics machine, as you said. So thank you for those two thoughts. Thank you so much for answering. It's just just another thing that I was thinking while I was listening to you, because I was thinking that there can be a game of cricket. We invite people to play a game of cricket or a game of football. But there can we invite somebody to play a game of God of War? That's like, that's that's the whole uh, mm -hmm. thing that I was trying to address in my head. So your talk really helped. Thank you so much. I will note it down for later. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Aritra has a question. You can unmute yourself. Um, am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so my, first of all, love the talk. Very fascinating insights to the whole idea of uh, distance and interactivity. And so my question was about interaction and uh, through interaction, as somebody earlier said, uh, about power, games giving us power. I was also thinking that this, uh, how through interactivity or restricted or non-interactivity, we are sort of trading power between the player and the game. So for example, I was thinking that uh, even though we are have, even if we are taking games which give us, uh, you know, traditional games, which mm, sort of give us uh, more interactive, uh, interactive abilities than interactivity than other games like Walking Simulator, or if, if even if I take exp other experimental titles like, for for example, Before Your Eyes, which is controlled by our Blink. But if I go through the other way where there is a lot of interactivity, even there, how much power do we think we really have? Because at the end of the day, we are following the rule sets of the game itself. We cannot really, if, if the game is meant to control by uh, maybe this stick, this uh, left stick or the right stick, it is meant to be controlled and you cannot really go beyond. Uh, so there, that was, I was thinking that how this 
power de- de- relation uh, also is affected by it's it's not i it's bit more of a comment than uh, uh, you know uh, a direct question so that's what i was thinking that uh, how interactivity itself is uh, also related with you know these subconscious or conscious kinds of power relations that is constantly being created between games and the gamer so to say um yeah i mean while you were uh, uh, commenting uh, i also kind of thought and it became clear to me that uh, this uh, interpretation of especially but not only but uh, especially with, with video games or or uh, computer games or digital games this kind of obsession that we have with power or the and it kind of ties it back to the first question or, or the, the first person has said the, about pleasure right so the games of power in a way are uh, supposedly uh, it seems that it's something that is uh, bringing us the most pleasure in a digital culture in a sense and then i think again of brian sutton smith i think um um thinking with his rhetorics and um, uh, all the seven different rhetorics that you will find in his book ambiguative play is just so revealing because this kind of game of power we can call it the game of power is only one of possible rhetorics and it's just this very I think it's a particular historical culture moment that we are in, and also the the the, the digital tool, uh, which uh, so many. Um, I think there is a reason why recently we have more games where we where we delegate a lot of that power, either to bots or we do mods where games play themselves. So we play with the idea of actually giving up the power or delegating it, and then watching the system kind of perform on its own. And we, if we think about video games uh, historically and how they emerge in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and out of that moment of computer technology and cybernetics, and that moment where we, where we uh, interact with that technology and where, where we have a lot of this kind of power relationship, pressing the button, controlling, and exercising the power over the, uh, over the machine. And this kind of uh, way of playing, because it's just only one facet of play, it becomes so um, prevalent in video games. And then this, uh, of course, on the theoretical level, this whole preoccupation with uh, interactivity as empowerment of the player, it's, it's in a way logical. Right now we are in the moment where technology and the way we use it to a, to a, to a greater degree is uh, we are not exerting that much power over it. It's ambient. It's happening in the background. It's, um, it's kind of doing things for us. A lot of things are automated. And so the, I, th- I think uh, now it's regardless of agential realism, it's just kind of to me realizing that that will be also reflected suddenly in our play practices. That's why so many games that are problematic or not games or not play because they don't give us enough power or enough skill, but they kind of reflect the way uh, we now interact or interact with technology today. It's much less of a power relationship uh, uh, these days. Um, So I think it's also kind of, yeah, it's revealing. Uh, We have uh, that we think of power and that we attribute so much um, power to power in a sense when we think about digital play. Yeah, I mean, I was also thinking because uh, since we are talking about interaction, we are, I was also thinking about, in a sense, non-interaction. And as Prabhar said that, uh, can I invite uh, to God of War? Uh, so it, that also, uh, also made me think that, for example, recently there are many uh, videos and uh, uh, being made on YouTube where people are modding games. Uh, For example, somebody modded Dark Souls where the player isn't playing, rather the game, the game characters from different other games themselves are uh, interacting with each other. So the whole, whole thing is the player isn't interacting at all, rather they have tweaked the system somehow so that the NPCs, so to say, are interacting mm. with each other, and so that was also that also seems like a kind of play to me, even though because sure. at the end of the day, NPCs are playing with each other, so that's also a thing. 
I am with you on this one. And I think uh, such examples actually, because uh, intra uh, activity and uh, Barat's theory is kind of one of the chapters. So it's it's like one of the elements uh, for my thinking with distance as this kind of framework. And the example that you're mentioning is particularly interesting because it shows, sure, it's, it's not like we're completely giving up our uh, power or agency, we're delegating it. So this is what, uh, when, I, when I say, oh, it's an aesthetic framework, is um, it's, we have still programmed those bots, right? Or we have used or made the mod or I used uh, the technology in one way or another to be able to, uh, to, to actually make the game play. But uh, the fact that I'm not pushing the button instantaneously and that uh, it's the action is delegated to an automated algorithm, whether it's visually represented by an NPC or not is another story. Uh, of course, it's still play. It's just it's delegated play. So the distance between me as the player and the game, in a way, maybe uh, metaphorically kind of um, extends. But um, yeah, I mean, I would say, of course, it's play. It's it is. It's just uh, we we play with technology in that in that sense, and um, it gives us this possibility to delegate the action, and and the example that you give. Oh, well, since we're running out of time, there are a few comments in the chat that I would like to read out for you. Uh, uh, first is Poonam that says that the inter interaction and interaction dynamic between games and human input is making me think of the ergodic continuum. Uh, uh, Nisarga says that speaking of God of War, it's interesting to note how power is partially given over by creators to Atreus. The diffusion of agency has added so much agency to the game when compared to the previous installments. Uh, Anubhav uh, says that the option to automate or play by oneself itself indicates more power. As, it, as it's up to the player to make the choices. And Poonam again uh, says that watching gameplays on YouTube, we can experience a game without actually playing or interacting with them. Would you like to uh, make any comments, uh, replies or anything, observations sure. to that? Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, okay, so starting from the, from the last, um, uh, watching gameplays on YouTube, we can experience a game without actually playing, interacting with them. I mean, yeah, that's a whether it's YouTube or Twitch or or um, watching esports on any other platform and this kind of spectatorship. Uh, this phenomenon has just um, has popularized itself in the, in the last few years, uh, uh, at least uh, quite exponentially. And um, I think it is it is of course. Um, a form of play, yeah, I mean, without actually playing. Um, there's so much in this that, it, I mean, we don't have time to go into the nitty gritty, but uh, just to kind of uh, play on this, I will uh, encourage you, maybe you know that text already, but go to uh, an early piece on interactivity by Lev Manovich. Uh, I think it's called, uh, it's a very short essay, actually. It's almost like a statement. I, I think it's called, uh, wait. Could you spell out the, the author's name? Yeah, Lev Manovich, uh, who's a new uh, a digital media theorist. And oh yeah, the text is called On Totalitarian Interactivity. I think it's quite interesting because in it, you will find the argument that it's, um, it's another criticism of interactivity from another angle than agent realism. It's just saying the fact that we can physically control something uh, uh, is not the only prerequisite for interactivity. And if you think about interactivity in cognitive ways, and this is, uh, of course, you will kind of see, oh, of course, books are interactive in that mm. sense, and films as well. They require so much cognitive effort when we, if we speak of effort, right? And there's been so much talk in game studies about players' effort, but it was the physical skill, uh, not only, but it's uh, interactivity in, in a lot of ways is so much based on this kind of physical skill mm. mythos almost. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's so much that goes into it. An option to automate or play by oneself itself indicates more power as it's up to the player to make the choice. Sure, I mean, it is, I think, again, uh, it depends on, on how you understand what is 
power, I guess, and why it's even power a necessary um, condition to understand play. I, I say uh, in one moment that to play is not only to control something, it's the power kind of end of things, it's also to let go. Um, let's leave it at that as that, but uh, I think uh, this kind of gives a little bit balance to, to this preoccupation with power and, con and exerting control, which is, of course, in, in most cases, it is a huge part of gaming and without any uh, doubt. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, automating, as, again, it's, it's delegating. Uh, there are many ways to understand it, I think. And one of the chapters I, I uh, and that paper actually exists uh, uh, it's on, D, on the DIGRA website. I talk about interpassivity, which is another concept from philosophy. And it's quite revealing because it actually, um, in a way, uh, allows us to understand what's so pleasant, talking about pleasure, in giving up. Right, and uh, so go to interpassivity. Uh, I think this concept is so helpful in in, in those cases. Um, diffusion of agency. Now, intra interaction and interaction, a dynamic between games and human input, making me think of the ergodic continuum. And I have to. I, I know Pavel, and if he's listening to it, and we'll watch it. It will be, um, wait, I don't, I'm not entirely familiar with uh, what he meant by the ergodic continuum. So that, uh, that, that term, that phrase was in relation to walking simulators. It was his, um, it was a paper, um, I think it was called, um, it's, a, it's like a walk in the park. That's the paper's name. And that's where he had mentioned it briefly. And uh, so just kind of, um, yeah, I see that, okay, internet is bliss in that sense, the emergence of a, the ergodic influence of narrative within walking sim, oh no, but that's another author, um, ergodic continuous scale to classify games based on their ergodicity. Um, okay, I haven't, uh, it's really hard to answer correctly because I haven't read it, but I, I think, uh, uh, I assume, because I don't know, but I assume it, it is uh, still something different. I wouldn't say that interaction and interaction are on the, they cannot be a continuum. And the simple okay. fact is that they're both based on totally different ontologies, right? And that's yeah. the whole problem of realism. Interaction, interaction is an ergodicity by extension, because it's it's another term, right, from uh, our, um, Espen Arso, but it is about this, um, that the fact that we can physically and uh, change uh, the infrastructure of whether it's a literary piece or, or a game is a, is a different thing, but uh, it has a lot to do with power and control mm -hmm. and okay. interaction. But it's uh, so ergodicity and interaction are on the same ontological level. It's this Cartesian uh, ontology, right? And if you go into Barad, and, and that's why I start, I, I try to kind of uh, bring in this uh, example from uh, physics, which might be quite confusing, but take time to read her. It's quite complicated. It's another ontological level. It's, it's one that is saying interaction means for interaction to happen, you have to have two independently existing things, subject and object, mm. and they pre-exist the interaction. That's the whole yeah. idea. Um, Whereas with interaction, the ontology is relational. It means things are only possible to be defined and in the moment of happening. It's the phenomenon oh. that you're looking at. It's not, they don't exist prior. And on the human level, it's very hard to grasp because we're like, okay, what do you mean they don't exist prior? I, I, I am a player, I'm a gamer. I exist prior to sitting in front of the screen and playing God of War. Well, yes and no, uh, but the moment you actually enter into that situation, things happen and they are very specific. So actually you do not pre-exist that moment. And I mean, it's easier said than done. And um, I can only encourage you to, to delve into, into Barad, but I think it's quite eye-opening. And I, I think, um, um, yeah, I, these two things are really, it's a different ontological level, so uh, they wouldn't be on any type of continuum because they just totally exclude one another. It's the, just the playfulness of terminology that might uh, suggest that they kind of belong together, but they don't. 
I'm so glad that you um, uh, kind of elaborated on this because we, a lot of us think of ergodicity quite a bit because of our set and its text. So I'm so glad that you answered it so well. It has, uh, I mean, it's super really useful and I think it. it's great that, that, that you work with that concept. I just think that if we go into interaction and Barad and uh, it just complicates things so much more. And it's not a new theory. It's been there yeah. for a while and it has been applied uh, to many other um, uh, disciplines. I didn't have time and I already spent an hour, uh, so I didn't actually have time to, to show you uh, how it has been applied in other disciplines. It has also been uh, a, a subject in game studies. Not a few, uh, but uh, a few of uh, uh, my colleagues have, and I have one extra slide. I will just show you super quickly. So that, and you can just take a screenshot maybe. And um, just uh, to give you an idea, Oh, sorry, I don't see the the control panel which I need to in order to share that slide with you. Well, in the in the oh, there it is. Um, but if we run out of time, I can also share the slides. And then, um, okay, do you do you see this slide with a lot of names on it? Yes, I do. Take I take a screenshot. It's just there's, there's no. But it's uh, so you, there are a few people who work explicitly with Barad and games. Just the past few years, to be honest, Justin Ayani, Connor, um, Seth Giddens didn't work with Barad. But in 2005, he, he also works with this human and non human idea, but it takes and so uh, a, a different uh, theoretical lens, uh, so um, theory. And so actor network theory. Alenda Chang talks about non-human agency, uh, not Barat, but uh, let's say a different perspective, but a similar move. Jan Stashenko, less known to Anglophone uh, readers, but uh, from Poland and um, post-human intimacy. Paolo Rufino, even Franz Meira, uh, I say even because Franz Meira used to be quite Cartesian in his early days. But in the last uh, uh, year or two, he has been thinking about hybridization of players' agency. And uh, then you have, of course, Darshana uh, and his performativity and thinking with Benjamin, with, um, with uh, Gregory Bateson. And uh, in the chapter, I didn't say it today, I have this uh, uh, quote from Gregory Bateson, which I also found in Darshana's work, which is talking about play as a model. And it's just, again, this, it's not Barat, it's 1977, but it's the same thinking or similar thinking as a, a model and, a, and a game does not precede the model. It is in the model. And that's this performative uh, uh, kind of um, uh, take on, on play. Anyway, it's a, it's a lot of different names, different theories, but they all have this one thing in common. They problematize the subject object relationship and the interaction yeah. as a, in a way as a concept or so human. Cool. Okay, so now I'm This whole concept is so I, uh, new to us, new to, at least for me, it's very, it just opened up a new, it just opened up my brain quite a bit. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was my, uh, yeah, a, a bit like uh, my, it, it's opened my mind as well. And I thought, uh, why not just bringing it a little bit to games yeah. studies and, and shaking it up a bit, and then we see what happens. <laughs> but it's not an easy one. It's also quite, all the, the questions that you've asked are also kind of uh, showing how it's such, it just turns things so much upside down that it's... Yeah. Uh, it qu takes quite a while to kind of uh, think with it, in a way. So cool. Uh, do we have any more questions? Or, or Jeffrey? Well, we have AlphaGo. Yeah, we just have <laughs> we just have like one last comment and a question, I guess, from Prabash. That was that uh, the point, however, is uh, was AlphaGo playing against the champ? Can the AI mm. think of play or does it just appear as playing to that which is human it's a central question in the discourse sure i mean my interpretation because again i mean you know uh, i don't think there are definite answers but i would say of course it's not playing it's just us anthrop anthropomorphizing technology 
And that was, of course, from the perspective of that uh, to play is, um, uh, which is also funny of me to say, because I try to show that play is not only human, not only human, but not human. But uh, I think what I mean by this is not necessarily play, be because it's a human condition. Animals play too, but it's, it's living beings in a way. And uh, if we think about technology, we, I, th I think it's this, again, it's, it's an, it's, a, to me, it's, it's an example of delegation. We are designing, we as humans, that piece of technology, that algorithm. Of course, those algorithms are the so-called uh, self-learning algorithms and um, they are kind of playing with, with each other or with it, it plays with itself, but it's a system. It's a program algorithm. And uh, it's just kind of out of the control of the programmer in a certain way because it keeps replaying itself. And then by doing this, it gets better and better and better. But, um, I think from this uh, theoretical perspective is another, uh, it's another instance of delegation. So I wouldn't say that the algorithm plays. I mean, of course it performed the moves within a certain context of the game of Go. And it was in that sense, in my metaphorically playing with Lisa Dahl and with other players, but it's, uh, uh, it's not, you, you, somebody mentioned today um, intentionality and uh, you know there's a lot of other terms. It doesn't have the consciousness of uh, it's performing whatever it was designed for. And even if that design is also kind of um, emergent and uh, out of our hands in a sense, but we've made it play. I mean, it's, it's a big shortcut by saying we, but yeah, <laughs> but like a mod. Yeah, do androids play with electric sheep exactly? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so, well, I guess with this, we will bring an end to today's session. Uh, on the behalf of Digra, the Digra India team, I would once again like to talk, uh, thank Dr. Fizek for taking the time to talk to us and present us with an absolutely wonderful presentation. So thank you once again. My pleasure. And uh, it's been, yeah, it's been wonderful two hours with you. Thanks so much. Sonia, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jovic. Uh, and I would like to also thank everyone who was able to join us today. Uh, we are Digra India, and uh, you can also get in touch with us uh, in the links that we have provided in the chat. For those who would be viewing this video later, uh, the links for getting in touch with us are below in the description. You can check us out. So thank you once again, everyone. And it's been a pleasure.